Hello and welcome to the Complete History of Science. Series 4, Episode 6, Roger Bacon. Roger Bacon is amongst the more enigmatic figures in the history of science. Over the centuries, his status has shifted greatly, and to this day, there are ongoing debates about his legacy. A century after his death, Bacon earned a reputation as a magician and perhaps a practitioner in the dark arts. This perception was fortified by Peter of True, who claimed Bacon could summon bridges from thin air and possessed a mirror enabling him to spy on any part of the earth. This fantastical image endured well into the 16th century, when Elizabethan playwright Robert Greene characterised Bacon as a necromancer and the creator of a demonic talking brass head. By the 19th century, however, this reputation had entirely reversed. The historian, William Wirrell, wrote a book known as The History of the Inductive Sciences, which credits Bacon with keeping alive the light of scientific inquiry amidst what was perceived as the barbarous Middle Ages. According to this account, Bacon not only kept scientific curiosity alive, but also emerged as the pioneer of the scientific method. Naturally, the reality is more nuanced. Bacon was both an observant churchman and an important medieval philosopher, a reformer, but also a man of his time. He undoubtedly has a role in the history of science, though perhaps it's not quite the one we may assume. Roger Bacon was born near Ilchester, southwest England, in around 1220. His family was wealthy, and he was born at a time when England was regaining its prosperity after the disastrous reign of King John. In the 1230s, Roger entered the University of Oxford. As a younger son, Roger was not likely to inherit, and by this time, university was becoming the standard path for a career in the church. In Oxford, Roger would have found a much larger town than Ilchester, including four large markets and surrounded by stone city walls. The city had grown due to its strategic location, along the Thames, and teaching there had begun as early as 1096, when the scholar Theobald de Vetton had made it his home. In the mid-12th century, the university grew further as war between France and England forced English students to stay home rather than travel to the more prestigious University of Paris. Despite this, Oxford had only just formally been recognised as a universitas around 1230. When Roger arrived, the university still wouldn't have had any permanent structures, and lectures took place in large rented rooms around the town. Nevertheless, Roger enjoyed his study at Oxford, being introduced to both natural philosophy and the mathematical subjects of the quadrivium, that is, arithmetic, geometry, music and astronomy. He graduated around 1241 with an MA, before continuing his studies and teaching in Paris. This was an ideal time for the young man to have arrived, as it coincided with a period where the University of Paris was once again opening up to the study of Aristotle. Masters, like Roger, would have been much in demand, bringing with him his knowledge of Aristotle's natural philosophy. Roger, however, especially enjoyed Paris because of the large selection of books which were available there. Coming at the end of the translation movement, Roger had access to virtually all of the translated work from antiquity and the Islamic world. He also had the money to pay for these works, probably due to an income from his family. He later estimated that he'd spent around £2,000 on books during his lifetime, a literal fortune. To put this in context, the yearly income of a labourer in England would have been around a pound. He stayed in Paris for a few years, lecturing on grammar, logic, arithmetic, astronomy and geometry, probably returning to England around 1250. Here, 
he likely continued his work as a private scholar until around 1257, when he joined the Franciscan order. Quite why Roger decided to join the Franciscans is unknown, and maybe somewhat surprising. The Franciscans were an order of monks whose defining feature was a vow of absolute poverty. To enter, Roger would have had to renounce his worldly possessions and would have to give himself entirely to the order. Contemporary scholars usually sought to gain a benefice from the church, which provided a regular income while allowing them to live a relatively free life. Perhaps Roger was unlucky and unable to secure one of these incomes. He may have also been broke, having spent his fortune on books. The Franciscans were known for their interest in nature, and it wasn't unknown for monks in the order to continue their scholarly pursuits. However, we also can't discount the idea that Roger had a genuine vocation. He was undoubtedly deeply religious, and his scholarly work was guided by this conviction. St. Francis was also like Roger, born into relative wealth and privilege, and we can speculate he may have felt some kinship with the saint who would renounce all of his material wealth. Regardless of the reasons, joining the Franciscan order was quickly to curtail Bacon's academic pursuits. He was dispatched to a convent in Paris, where he was given menial tasks and forbidden to leave. The reasons for this were political, because he became embroiled in an internal dispute between different factions of the Franciscans. This squabble was between two groups who disputed the meaning of the vow of poverty laid down by St. Francis. On one side, the spirituals believed that the vow of poverty should apply equally to the individuals as well as the whole organisation. On the other side, the conventuals believed that while the individual must own nothing, the order could still have possessions, for example buildings. We don't know Roger's exact thoughts on this matter, but given his punishment, he likely sided with the spirituals, who were being suppressed by the papacy. This must have been a very frustrating time for Bacon, who was used to pursuing his own academic interests without restraint. In response, he spent the next few years writing letters to friends and acquaintances in the hope he would be allowed to return to Oxford. This was mostly futile until he contacted a man called de Fuchs. Fuchs was the papal legate to England during a turbulent period where war between France and England had once again broken out. Fuchs must have been a very busy man, but he still found time to respond to Roger, having heard of his reputation as a master at Paris. It turns out this correspondence would be extremely fortunate, as Fuchs was a man on the rise, and in the next few years would become Pope. Roger wouldn't return to England immediately, but instead something even greater would happen. Fuchs would ask Roger to write a book. Unfortunately, there seemed to have been a mix-up during their communication, and Fuchs, now Pope Clement IV, appears to have believed the book was already written. Even worse, Bacon's poverty meant that he had no access to writing materials such as parchment, which he would need to complete it. He again needed to appeal to friends and family for the funds to write. Bacon spent the year 1267 writing seemingly without pause, and by the end he had completed the so-called Opus Majus, literally his great work. Stretching to some million words, it was divided into seven parts and covered philosophy, theology, mathematics, optics and ethics. Its intention was to serve as a new basis for the university curriculum and refocus it on areas which Bacon considered most important. Bacon placed special emphasis on optics, which had been a neglected field in medieval Europe. His contribution, however, was not original so much as a blending of the great achievements of his predecessors. Bacon knew the optics of Plato 
Aristotle, Euclid, Alkindi and Ptolemy, borrowing from each of them. However, his work predominantly followed the outline laid down by Al-Haytham, adopting his theory of intromission. From all this, Bacon developed his own philosophical theory of light, which, somewhat confusingly, he called his theory of multiplication of species. In this context, we should understand species as being the form of an object. It was derived from Al-Kindi's idea that light emanates from every point on an object in every direction. Bacon's theory was complicated, and I don't want to get lost in the details, so instead, I'm going to quote the great historian of science, David Lindbergh. Alkindi argued that rays emanate in all directions from every point of everything in the cosmos, conveying the powers of things to surrounding objects. As a result of this radiation, Bacon surmised that every place in the world contains rays from everything that has actual existence. Everything acts on everything else, and the cosmos becomes an intricate network of forces responsible for everything from the radiation of heat to astrological influence and the efficacy of prayer. From this passage, it's clear that Bacon conceived optics as not just the science of light and vision, but as the key to religious and philosophical truth. In Bacon's work, scientific, philosophical and spiritual ideas are mixed together in a way that's impossible to entirely disentangle. Nevertheless, there's still one part of the opus majus, which is still vital that we discuss. The sixth part, known as Scientia Experimentalis. Opus majus was supposed to be a reforming work, one with which he intended to reset the university curriculum based on his own priorities. However, more than this, he also wanted to change how students and masters approach the acquisition of knowledge. Bacon stressed how in the universities, emphasis was placed on debate and argument, or in a word, reason. This was fine according to Bacon, but he believed that while reason was important, truth must ultimately derive from experience. He elaborated that while reason may be very important for drawing out a conclusion, Ultimately, it was necessary for the mind to discover the truth of a proposition through experience. He makes an analogy to try and explain this idea. Imagine a person who has never seen fire. We could explain to them the idea of fire and how it behaves. However, without touching it and experiencing it for themselves, they'll never truly know what we mean when we say the fire is hot. Bacon was also inspired by his predecessors, especially al Haytham, and emphasised that measurement was a key aspect of this process. From measurement, Bacon suggested that new instruments and new data could be yielded, which would lead to new knowledge. To illustrate this idea, he gave an example, which was an investigation into the rainbow. This was intended as an exemplar for how such an inquiry might be carried out. Bacon starts by reviewing the literature on the rainbow, mainly from Aristotle, and he describes the phenomena. Next, he begins to make some measurements, firstly of the altitude of the rainbow, then the size and shape, as well as the altitude of the sun. From these measurements, he demonstrates that the altitude of the rainbow is always inversely proportional to the altitude of the sun. He also demonstrates that the arc of the rainbow is always constant, measuring 42 degrees. This is the first time this value was recorded, demonstrating he very likely made this measurement himself. Based on these investigations, Bacon attempts to give a causal account of the rainbow, which he attributes to the reflection of the sun's light from individual rain droplets. This was partially correct. The sun's rays are reflected by the droplets, though it misses refraction and dispersion, a key element in creating the rainbow's colours. 
A generation later, another scholar monk, Theodoric of Freiburg, clearly inspired by Bacon's analysis, gives a relatively complete theory of the rainbow's formation. Regardless, the important part of this analysis wasn't so much the rainbow as it was the method through which we might derive knowledge. Bacon was attempting to introduce to European thought a new method of inquiry. Scientia experimentalis was not the controlled experiments which we'll see in the 17th century, but it did place experience as the ultimate guide to truth. For Bacon, the reasoned arguments of the lecture hall could never lead to certainty, and hence we could never be sure of the truth. Instead, if we want truth, we need to go out into the world and look for ourselves. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode. This is just a quick note to let you know that this is the final episode in the current series. Once again, the Complete History of Science podcast will be going into a long winter while I research the next series. I hope that you're patient and bear with me and believe that the podcast will definitely be back sometime in 2024. In the meantime, if you can rate the podcast on Spotify or Apple, I greatly appreciate it and it helps a lot in expanding the reach of the podcast. I'd also like to thank everybody who's getting in touch with questions and comments about the show. Please feel free to continue doing that and I'll respond to everybody I can. Until next time.